Okay, let's start the music. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Eric Rothschild, your host of Garden Fork Radio. I'm here with co-host Mike. Hello. Uh, I'm in the basement. We have a new studio set up here. It involves a furniture blanket. Um, if you hear a rumbling noise, that's the uh, hot water heater turning on. Someone's taking a shower. Um, and welcome. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. We have all sorts of stuff to talk about. We probably will we'll probably run out of time before we get to it all, but it's been a, a big viewer mail week here. And you said that uh, the chainsaw video normally one of those kicks off many many viewer mail. Yeah, whenever you make a chainsaw video, it gets a lot of commentary on YouTube uh, and on the site, and then people just email me as well. So we got a bunch of stuff going on, and we have some bee stories and a story about a wood floor, a lesson, a lesson about a wood floor, and uh, whatever Mike wants to talk about as well. So, oh, yeah. I've got my bag garden and um, the uh, farmer's market uh, report. Well, let's start. I mean, I've got the picture right in front of me. Mike sent me a picture of his uh, potting soil bag garden. And we talked about this a couple times, but it's basically you get a bag of potting soil from the store. You cut it open and you plant in it. Literally, it sits like a like a like a bag of soil on one end. And you cut it open, and boom, there's your garden. And Mike has planted some stuff, and he sent me a picture. So, uh, so what I, I'll, we, what, I'll post this picture, and you, you can see by the surrounding, the, uh, uh, we'll call it foliage around the I uh, call bags. It chaos. Chaos, yeah. I've done nothing. It's <laughs> just the garden. And um, this is, I did this a week ago. I, I, I put these down and um, no, I spritzed them with water until the mosquitoes attacked me. I ran in. Yeah. But this this week we had some good rain and I haven't had to do a thing to these. And um, it, you can see going from left to right in the in the picture, uh, one of them is um, carrots and you can barely see it when wow. there's all three of them. But it's if you see the other picture, it's a little bit more close up, and they're they're sprouting all over the place. I see that. That looks great. And in the middle, oh, and all I did was I I just broadcast broadcasted the seeds and just kind of took my fingers and and mixed up the soil. You know, didn't not, not much, just enough to kind of get a little bit of soil over the top of them. I, I think if I just took the palm of my hand and patted them, that would have been the same. Um, and then in the center there is I think those are radishes. Yes, they look like radishes. And they're going crazy. You see, it looks like a chia pet. <laughs> yeah, I um, I also planted some radish seeds, and it's like the thing that's that has the most instant gratification I've ever found. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was amazed by that. And then, uh, and clearly, this is before I've thinned it out. I'm gonna have to go through there and kind of pull them apart a little bit. Yeah, yeah, especially the carrots. Yeah, and then uh, all the way on the end there, it's a little bit less going on because they were bigger seeds. So there's, you know, some beans in there, and um, uh, what did I? I've, I've forgotten already what I've planted over there. It looks there, like so. might be cucumbers over there. Yeah, cucumbers and some beans. That's right. And then cool. the, in the fronts of the bags, there's some little slots cut in there, and there's some tomatoes and some um, flowers. The 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 chamomile. And all that is sprouting. It's been a week, and it's all sprouted. And so while I might have been very late, it's um, I think I'll be okay. I think I'll have some produce this summer. It looks great, the whole bag gardening thing, which is perfect for a patio or a, a deck or, you know, where you're just you're gardening on concrete. Yeah, or a corner of the yard. You just, you, if you're like me, you just uh, no time this year for it. So I just yeah, yeah. literally at the grocery store bought this kind of hot popular bland, brand of this. Uh, and I, I went all out and got the moisture holding stuff. Yeah. But uh, you don't even have to spend that, you know, three or four bucks a bag and, you know, a few bucks worth of seeds. And I've got a garden. Yay. <laughs> and uh, um, so, you know. And also late in the season. So if you forget by a month or two, don't let that discourage you. And no, then, not you know, at all. I, I think a lot of people for, you know don't realize that you can plant in the middle of the summer. You can plant in the fall. Uh, radishes especially or lettuces, uh, stuff that grows quick. I mean, tomatoes take all summer. Potatoes take all summer. But the, a lot of stuff, you can plant kale in August and you'll get kale and you can harvest kale in the fall, you know? Yeah, I think I've gone through three be bean plantings before. 
Yes, you, you can. Know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. They grow very quickly, and you know I enjoy them. Um, and this is we're we're coming up on the Fourth of July this coming weekend, and my drive to the uh, farmers market. Uh, the corn is almost knee high, so wow. we're, we're right on right on target for that. Knee high by Fourth of July, and um, and so you know even though it's so late, you can see by these pictures, which again I'll post. Um, no reason why not to plant. I love it. Did you find any uh, like interesting things with the farmers market lately, or? Um, nothing that knocked my socks off. We were happy that a lot of the things that we enjoy about it were still there, yep. and it's it's still growing. Um, and this time of season, you're still seeing, we're still seeing garlic scapes and leafy greens and, uh, kind of small onions. That's, that's the big thing going around. And, um, and the typical baked goods, which are always, you know, wow, they're so good. <laughs> you know, they, they almost don't make it home. And yeah, uh, we, there's a loaf of bread we always buy and I call it the, I call it the drug addictive bread, you know, cause it's just <laughs> like, you just like, brruh, 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 you know, you just, you're tearing off chunks in the car. So what's also nice about the, the, the farmer's market is, um, and I'm going to get into a little bit of a story. We, in, in the town of Woodstock, that's where a DMV office is. And I took my daughter on Saturday to, to get her driver's license. Cool. to pass her test yeah and she was really nervous and um she kind of got a crabby old lady <laughs> and uh -oh. uh, i'm like oh no and uh uh and she failed the first time which you know isn't earth i failed my first time and i'd been driving since i was like 14 yeah <laughs> you know and somehow i failed because i got a little overconfident she was just a little bit too nervous and she was she was upset she was disappointed um you know, the, the, it just, uh, it wasn't a good day for her. She just kind of wanted to go home. I said, well, no, we're in Woodstock. We're going to go to the farmer's market. And we went to the farmer's market and we had lunch sitting outside and we walked around and there was music playing and she bought herself a cookie and just the whole, it was a, a, a real serene community scene. And she forgot all about passing the test. Or oh, not cool. passing the test. And we went home and she was in a really good mood. And I'd say that's part of the reason I go to the farmer's market as well. It's not always just like, oh, you know, we're going to be sustainable and we're going to eat within 100 miles of our house and we're going to support the local farm. All that stuff is good. But just being there and walking around is really nice. Is really nice. And community and all the rest of that. So it's it's calming even to a teenage kid. Well, I, I, <laughs> I, I helped you calm today, uh, this week. I sent you a cool link to a, to an, a neat iPhone Android <laughs> app. You did. I, I When I go to the train, I cut it a little close. Not so close that it's ridiculous, but like I don't, you know, don't want to stand on the platform for 15 minutes waiting for a train. So I get there, so I'm only standing there for five minutes to catch the train. And my train showed up like six, seven minutes early. And in order to get to the platform, you've got to cross the tracks, which is illegal. They just yeah. won't let you do it. And so I had enough time to walk all the way from one end of the train to the other to the conductor and give him a look and point at my wrist. You're like, you know, look what time it is. <laughs> You're early. Can I walk around? And he said no. And, and he, they drove off, and I was just fuming, fuming mad. And I got into the next train, which is, a, you know, seven minutes later, but... Um, gets me to work 20 minutes later, and I get an email from Eric at like six in the morning. That was this iPhone app. And do you want to describe this? Yeah, it's really cool. It's called Leaf Snap, L E A F S N A P, and it was created by the Smithsonian University, Columbia University, and University of Maryland. And it's a it's an iPhone app, and they will have it for the Droid soon. And you take a picture of a tree, of the leaf of a tree. And it will more than likely identify the tree for you. And they're asking research volunteers to help them create an even larger database than the database they have of this. And this is great because I know what a cherry is and I know what an oak is and sometimes a maple, you know. But there's all these trees out there and I don't know what they are. So if you take a, a picture with your phone of the leaf, they, they ask against a white background. But you could probably use, you know, a, a newspaper or a book or whatever or, or cement bright white sky or something yeah. will probably do it too yeah. and um it looks it up and tells you information about it so i thought that was pretty cool now uh, here's I, here's the g whiz that made me go that this is what snapped me out of my bad mood it, it, it was that 
every time you do this, you're kind of you're giving them you're taking a picture of your tree leaf, which you're in front of the tree. Um, and I'm guessing you have to tell them that it's OK, but it's capturing your location. So not only are you getting to identify a tree leaf, but they're getting to know where that tree lives. Yeah. And over time, especially if this goes global, they'll be able to get tree populations and where they live and all kinds of really valuable scientific data from people just being, you know, learning what kind of tree it is. So it's like this, you know, this information symbiosis where both people get something out of the deal that's valuable to them. I, I think that's really cool. And that that's what Snap, I'm, I'm just sitting there imagining all the different things you could do with that. They were talking about fish. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking, you know, types of stone, <laughs> you know, all kinds of things. That you're are, are you're basically crowdsourcing a research project mm -hmm. to use some big buzzwords there. That was crowdsourcing. <laughs> I've never heard that one. That's pretty cool. Well, you know, us social media experts. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just thought it was really cool. And like maple trees, there are sugar maples, red maples, rock maples, Norway maples, you know, and I want to tap my maple trees. And I know some of them are sugar maples, but are all of them sugar maples? You know, I thought, oh, I could use this phone app to help me learn. Because the leaves will all look like maple trees, but they're slightly different. Yeah. So that's a big deal. I, you know, I almost sent you another email when you said I was in a, such a bad mood, which would be one word, and that is breathe. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm getting much better at not letting most things bother me anymore. And I feel much better about it. It's, you know, in the bigger picture... You know, if you can, if I can wake up and walk and talk, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> so. I, I think I have a real positive outlook on life. I'm always in a pretty good mood, even though people say I look grumpy. I don't know what the deal is with that, but I, I don't, <laughs> I, um, I'm always feeling pretty good. I, I don't know, just something about it set me off. I, I, and really, if I, if I think hard about it, I bet you, there was something else going on. Yeah. You, you know, know on, a, on a little tangent here, um, I'll, just kind of a word to everyone, you know, we're always talking about how, you know, anonymous is not anonymous and everyone knows everything about you on the Internet. Um, when you have a meltdown in public, someone may very likely be videotaping <laughs> it with their phone and uh, and they're going to put it on YouTube. Yeah, that would be embarrassing. And then if it goes viral, someone's going to identify you and then your name is there. Your name's everywhere. With this, you know, screaming mad man yells at train conductor. <laughs> exactly. You know, oh, Mike. Just, Mike from just... Chicago. And then, you know, then the New York Post gets your name and, and Huffington Post. and <laughs> Exactly. And I'm so, out to dinner and everybody's calling me the screaming mad And, train. you know, for the next 10 years, it's like, there's that guy. <laughs> the guy that, that, that's Meltdown Man. <laughs> Mike Meltdown Man. <laughs> you know, so be careful, everyone. You may be very angry, but uh, the public outburst... Uh, could very well be recorded. Yeah, look at yeah, and my meltdown. Uh, it, it, you know, it was me pointing at my watch and then giving him a shrug, like what, what, what the heck? You know? Yeah, that's a that. So luckily, I don't go you know overboard. Okay, do you feel yeah. better now? I do. I'm good. <laughs> we were. Uh, can I tell? Can I tell my uh, my uh, problem story of the week? Yeah. Uh, I do, you know, we do painting and we were painting the uh, studio of a jewelry store. It's in the back where they make this and it's a very high end jewelry store in Brooklyn. And the artist woman who owns the jewelry store, she's a very nice lady. We do a lot of work for her. And she goes, I want my studio to be completely white. And she mentioned some designer that she admires who has a completely white studio as well. I'm like, okay, so we painted all the walls white. We painted the ceiling white. She goes, no, 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 I want the floor white too. And I was like, well, I've never really painted a floor before. So I went to the hardware store and I said, I got to paint a floor. It's, it's a wood polyurethane floor. What do I use? And the owner of the store hands me this paint. It says floor and cement paint. And I'm like, okay. So, and we read the back and it says, uh, we'll do polyurethane floors. It says if the floor is shiny, you need to sand it. And this thing was dull, really, really dull. So I was like, okay, I guess we don't need to sand it. So we put three coats of this stuff on, and um, it wouldn't stick. Oh, no. And whenever the lady would roll her chair, 
the paint would come up. <laughs> oh, okay. And, you know, she, she calls me or her manager calls and I'm like, I go over there and I'm like, you know, I mean, you can't, I, all my business is word of mouth, so I can't walk away from this. I can't say, well, the paint said it would work, you know, and I was like, right. okay, we'll make this right. So, uh, they went on, uh, they closed for a vacation in the summer and I rented a floor sander and Tony who works with me has sanded floors before. And what should have taken a couple of hours took two days. So, <laughs> Oh no! Now the belt, I mean the sander. It was it like a giant belt sander type floor sander? Yeah, and they draw thirty five amps. Wow! Which they don't tell you until after you've signed all the paperwork and say, by the way, you need a thirty five amp outlet to run this thing. <laughs> so we get to the studio, and all the all the outlets are fifteen amps, except for there's a two forty volt fifty amp outlet in the middle of the room, which looks like it ran some sort of like wa big washing machine or some kind of big electric heater of some sort. So I got the male plug to that and I split two um, 110 volt lines off this plug because 240 is basically made of the, the two 120 hot lines that come off your breaker panel. You know, you've got two hot legs that come into your panel and a, and a neutral. Should we add don't try this at home? Don't try this at home. <laughs> so... That took half the day to run around and find the parts and figure this out. And then we fire the thing up and we've lost half a day. And, and uh, my friend that I was working with is a perfectionist and I'm like, we're going to lay really thick enamel paint on this. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you can't tell him that because he's going to make it perfect anyway. So into, uh, it took a day, basically it, it took half a day to fix the electric it took a day to sand it. And then uh, he was doing the last passes of the sander with the 80 grit. And it looked beautiful. It was too bad we had to paint it. I was out buying the paint at a different paint store. Uh, a, it's a modified epoxy enamel made by General Coatings. And the stuff is bulletproof. And he calls me and he goes, all the lights are out in the store, Eric. And I'm like, okay, I'll be right there, you know? <laughs> oh, no. So I go back there, and literally all the lights are off in the store and the studio in the back. And he goes, oh, well, you know, the, the, the sander stopped working, and all the lights went out. And I was like, well, it popped a breaker. And so I opened the panel. And most circuit breaker panels have a main bar at the top, which uh, controls all the electricity in that apartment or house or whatever, right? Uh -huh. Well, there's no main bar. There's no main breaker. And the breaker that we were running off of hadn't tripped either. So I was like, okay, i got to go in the basement and find out where the power comes into the building. So I find the power coming into the building, and I find the first floor uh, electric meter. Right below that is a six-inch wide circuit breaker, and it's the main. Uh -huh. And usually to reset a breaker, you press it to off, and then you flip it back to on. Right. right? This thing wouldn't move. Oh. Oh, there goes the boiler. <laughs> you, you can hear that roaring noise? Yeah. Let's uh let's hold on for a minute. Maybe that thing'll turn off. Okay. All right, we'll be back in a minute. If you want to leave us a comment or a question or just kind of talk to us, you can leave us a message at our Garden Fork Radio voicemail, 860-740-6938. That's 860-740-6938. Uh, everyone, that noise you hear is the hot water heater. We have uh, my in-laws are visiting. It just turned on. So, <laughs> all right. So, uh, I go down to the main uh, power panel, and this breaker will not turn back on again. And I'm like, what am I gonna do? Because this, the store, you know, the artists are on vacation, but the retail portion of the store is open. You know. <laughs> oh. Um. So I called a plumber friend of mine. I said, I need an electrician right now. And he gave me the name of a friend of his. And the guy came right over. It was very cool. And, uh, you know, I wasn't about to mess with this thing because what if I broke it even more? And he went down there and he basically said, sometimes they get kind of sticky, but I managed to turn it back on again. Okay. Um, and so I was like, I was just near meltdown mode. I was like, I just want to paint this floor and get out of here, you know? Yeah. So we rolled on this uh, paint, and you have to wear, uh, um, uh, I think it's called an organic vapor mask, but definitely for that kind of thing, you have to wear the heavy uh, respirator on there. So we had our respirators on, 
and um, it looks good. It looks really nice. But if anyone ever talks about sanding a floor, just hire the professionals, okay? <laughs> because the time and the money it's going to cost you. You know, we, we were going to rent the sander for a day. We ended up renting it for two days. Uh, we had to pay for all the sanding belts. It was our late, you know, our time. Plus, I had to pay one of my guys. And it would have been easier to call one of the local floor sander guys and said, you know, sand it down the bare wood. I'm going to paint it. And they would roll in, sand it down, and he'd be out in two hours. Right, right. So. Did, did you get any of this paint on your boots or shoes? No. Um, I had Tony do all the rolling. So. <laughs> <laughs> when i was a kid we we painted our swimming pool and it was this heavy duty epoxy based paint yeah and i had blue spots on my shoes that never ever went away yeah even on the bottoms it just never went away it's very tough stuff it's bulletproof that stuff so um so i for, i ran across some really cool aquaponics stuff which i uh sent you some links to and we'll post on our site as well uh the huffington post there's a woman there who wrote a quick article and made a video. Her name is Kirsten Dirksen on the Huffington Post. She is, uh, does she have a picture of a column? Uh, it's one of their green columns. But there is, uh, they're talking about soilless uh, farming on your rooftop. And they're interviewing a chef who grows um, vegetables on the roof where his restaurant is. And I thought it was pretty cool. Chef John Mooney. Uh, uh, he has a West Village restaurant called Bell Book and Candle. And it basically looks like these really wide, like eight or 10 inch wide PVC pipes that have little slots cut into them. They're on their end and they're sticking into a big plastic covered barrel uh, or a plastic bucket or a, like a, uh, you know, looks like a plastic tub of some sort, a round right. tub. It if I made any kind of comparison, it looks like, have you ever seen those um, outside the doors of any building where people stand around and smoke and there's this like big bottom on it that's got water on it in it? And yeah. then there's a place where you just put your cigarette in and I guess it falls down and goes out. Yeah. Um, it looks that, but bigger, bigger around. Yeah. And the nutrient water is in the bottom. And there's a tube that goes up to the top, and it basically sprinkles down nutrient water, I think, three minutes out of every 15 minutes. And it's, it's like hydroponic gardening. So you start the seeds in, uh, um, it's called lava ash or something. What's it called? Rock ash? These little compressed pellet plugs. Yeah, this was Eric was talking about yeah, this yeah. When, when he was talking about his aquaponic stuff, yeah. So it it was it's very interesting. It, it's I'm not I'm kind of not describing it very well, but this is an interesting way to rooftop garden uh, without having to haul a bunch of soil up there. The individual units are not cheap. Uh, the ones we're looking at here are five hundred dollars a piece, but you know after that initial five hundred dollar investment, there really isn't any other investment. You have to buy some of the nutrient, or maybe you could make your own nutrient. Yeah, but. Uh, it, it looks like they got a lot of bang for their buck here, and it's very cool. So we will uh, we will post the link to this. We'll also put the video right on our site. Um, but you can also go to Huffington Post, and if you type in uh, hydroponics or Kirsten Dirksen, uh, that's Kirsten with a K, it's it's really cool. And I immediately thought of your friend Eric about this. I was like, yeah. wow, how cool. Yeah, it, it is really cool. And the thing is, 500 bucks is steep, but it, I'm looking at it right now. And you get the whole everything you need to do it. You need you get the seed starter trays, you get the pumps, the timers, the um, the the mixes, and all that stuff. So I I looked at this and yeah this th this goes on my list and I hope I can do it one day. Yeah. The, the but I was yeah, sorry I was thinking about you with your rooftop yeah. uh, experiment. Yeah, because my rooftop experiment isn't going very well. So I thought. MyTowerGarden.com is the uh, company, MyTowerGarden.com, all one word. There's also one called BrainWrite, brain, brain like your brain, and then write like your right hand, uh, aquaponic site as well. And he has a similar system here, um, a vert integrated vertical tube system. His is a little different, but theirs is, uh, I think his is kind of more homemade. Yeah, and his involves fish like Eric's did. The yeah. other one, there's no fish. It's just for planting. Uh... But I think the other one, the uh, the My Tower uh, 
the My Tower Guard one could be modified for fish, the aquaponic gardening as well, I think. Yeah. yeah the, the, all this stuff is really neat. Yeah, it's very cool. So it's a soilless gardening using hydroponics. Uh, you could either hook it up with the uh, just the mineral fertilizer solution they sell, or you can. I could think you could rig it up to have your kind of fish aquaponic thing, like we were talking about before. But essentially, a closed system. So I thought that was kind of cool. Right, and going into one of our first uh, viewer mail here, and this actually this actually came from Eric, friend Eric. Um, what he said was he was talking about. I I think I said I wanted some kind of simple composting. Yeah, we were talking about simple composting. Yeah, I said five gallon bucket or something. If anybody has a cool idea or knows of something, point me the point me to it. He said do vermicomposting worms. I keep my homemade bin in the kitchen. And there's no smell. I use office paper shreds from work and the as the bedding, and three ten gallon plastic totes from the blue store. The worms produce castings. Poop. <laughs> it's just some of the richest nutrient compost possible uh, and is known as black gold. They also produce worm tea, which is a liquid form of the black gold. And so I'm thinking this worm tea together with, yeah, I bet you that would work as a great nutrient for the, the um, aquaponic thing. I don't know. Well, we'll have to have Eric back on. <laughs> Talk about the vermicomposting. Yeah, yeah vermicomposting, which, you know. I've heard about it, and a lot of people think, oh, my God, that's going to stink. It's in your kitchen and stuff, and there's worms involved. But uh, he says it doesn't, so I've got to hear more about it. Plus, uh, you're growing worms. Yeah. I don't know if you can take extras and throw them out in your garden or take them fishing or, or whatever. You can take them fishing. The the red wigglers that are the vermicomposting worms, it's my understanding that they don't fare as well in the outside garden, but I, I could be wrong. They... I've seen them in a lot of like just passive composting systems, and they thrive in that. Mm. Uh, but maybe regular garden soil. I don't know. I'm not the expert. I'm not the worm expert. <laughs> I did buy some new fishing tackle yesterday, though. Oh, I and I was thinking about that. We said we wanted to do a fishing show, and you said you'd come up with some questions for me. And I've been I've been thinking about ways to make it simple. And the the analogy I thought of the other day was it's kind of like asking a mechanic what tool. Yeah. You know, what what tool? What If I'm going to buy one tool, it's like, ah, oh, geez, you know, that you really can't narrow it down to one tool. But uh, oh, a big hammer. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard that saying that if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah. So but uh, we got to get something together with that. You bought some fishing tackle, huh? Yeah. And I bought a fishing pole and a little fishing kit that came with it. It was, it was uh and I bought some extra stuff. It's kind of like any any hobby, you know. You can get lost in the aisles of all the tackle and and the gear and all that. Oh yeah, I can spend a day in like one of the big fishing stores, you know, where it's all outdoor stuff. It's well, fun. My next stop is Cabela's. There's a Cabela's uh, east of here on the other side of Hartford. So yeah, we've got one of those too, and that's what I was talking about. You can spend all day in there. Yeah, yeah. All right, on to our chainsaw talk. Um, yes. So we were my uh, the camera operator wanted me to we had dropped some birch trees we dropped some big pines we had to take birch trees down as well and she finally got me to cut up the birch trees into into some fireplace logs and I was okay. like well can you burn birch in the fire you you can't do pine but birch is okay yeah birch birch it, it's very light it, it burns very quickly um, right but I was like you know hey it's it's rather than let it go to waste you know or uh, you know just let it sit there so. I thought, oh, let's make a video about how to how to cut logs because I think a lot of people, um, you know, you get this log laying on the ground. You don't want your chainsaw touching the dirt. You don't want when you're cutting through a log, you have to get that last couple inches and then your chainsaw hits dirt and that's bad. Yeah, so I've I done thought, a lot of chainsawing and stuff. And I got to say, from your videos, I've learned things. I've ne I've seen that, Jack, but didn't get it. Never understood what that was for. Right. So what we used was a thing called a timber jack, which allows you to essentially hoist up one end of the log and stick it up into the air so you can cut it without dropping your uh, chainsaw, um, the chain end bar, into the dirt. So, And there's another way too, but you have to watch, you all have to go and watch the video on our site because we need to, uh, we need traffic to our site right now, so I'm not going to tell you all the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I think the uh, water heater might turn back on again. All so right. If you hear a hum, everyone, that's the water heater in the background. 
the uh, camera operator wanted you to drop some other trees. Did you do that? Because <laughs> the video ended there. Yeah, I kind of was like, that's a to be continued. All right. Okay. It's a cliffhanger. It's a cliffhanger. Um, <laughs> I've actually learned a lot more about how to aim trees so they drop right where you want them. Because one of the pines I have to drop between my house and my woodshed. And there's only about 15 feet there uh, of space between the two. So, I, um, I have a question about the chaps you were wearing. Yeah. You have regular pants too, right? Yeah, I have uh, you know, the work pants on underneath that. Well, no, what I'm saying is because you had in, in your first video, you had... But basically, it looked like you bought a new pair of chaps. Did is that are they different from the other ones somehow? They're slightly different. They they also sell some chaps that will um, the Kevlar material. The chaps will wrap around your whole ankle. Okay. Um, you know the chaps mainly are on the front, the your thighs and the front of your uh, the bottom of your leg, and they may. I have three pairs, uh, basically because uh, I I got one as a gift and I bought one and I inherited a pair from someone who was moving out of town. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a, a telling viewer email here that we have. Uh, first one, I talked about the, the bar, the chainsaw in the video, and mine's kind of worn out. And a fellow from on the YouTube channel said, uh, your bar is probably fine. Each time you have the chain sharpened, put the bar back on upside down. It helps to even out the wear and doubles the life of the bar. Only needs replacing if it's bent or chipped or heavily worn on one side. So there you go. Cool. That's a good tip. Yeah. The bar is what the chain comes out of the engine and it runs along the bar. It's like a guide. And, you know, depending on the length of your bar, it's how big of a tree you can cut down. Um, hey, the- I've got I've got a tangent. You want, want to go on a tangent? It's related. Sure. I was I was watching. Um, what was it? It was uh, um, uh, popular science had the top 101 gadgets. Yes. And um I think one of them, they were talking about the chainsaw, uh-huh. and they said it was invented by a brain surgeon. Did you know this? No. It was it was meant originally for, you know, getting in there. <laughs> I guess sawing open, you know, the the uh, the, the top of your head. Wow. Was, and they modified it and made it into something to cut, uh, cut trees with. Wow. I still have to check that factoid, but that was, uh, I was like, wow, that's, yikes. But they were, the thing that they said also was, you know, it's been cutting down trees and filling America's emergency rooms since (laughs) its invention. (laughs) (laughs) So, okay, sorry. Do you want to read the, uh, the, the viewer mail? Yeah, here we go. So, uh, it says, hi, (laughs) Rachows. But, uh, hi, great info on this video. I showed my husband who has been using a chainsaw since he was 14. The original chainsaw video of you cutting down a tree, uh, and he thought the safety gear was a little overkill. Keep reading to find out how wrong he was. Fast forward a few months, and after I got him a new chainsaw for our anniversary, he went straight out and started cutting down some dead trees in our yard. After some major nagging about safety, he put on eye protection, and not five minutes later, a 10-foot-long section of a limb fell on his head. I saw the whole thing. It came down in a cartwheel type rotation. One end bounced off his face and the other end whacked him in the back of the head. Wow. He's, yeah. He's lucky to be alive. He's lucky. Uh, let's see. He's lucky he didn't lose his vision. He's lucky he could put his face back together. Some scarring. He's lucky he didn't get knocked out cold and drop the blade on his leg. The list goes on. It cost us $12,000 for medical bills and several, several gray hairs. Please, please, please listen to Eric and wear the safety gear. I'm going out and buying all the gear listed, and I'm sure it will cost far less than $12,000. Garden Fork knows best. How about that, huh? Yeah. Rick had the appropriate response, which I'm not going to (laughs) say. You'd bleep the whole thing. (laughs) Started with holy. (laughs) But yeah, wow. That's yeah. scary, and I bet you he just thought, you know, I'm going to go outside and try it. It's like, you know, driving around the block and not putting your seatbelt on. Yep. You, know, you should just always put it on. Um, yeah. You may Holy look like a goof, God. and you may ever, your neighbor's like, what the hell's he got all that stuff on for? But, yeah. I mean, I almost cut up on my thigh with the chainsaw, and I still have a thigh because I had my chaps on. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, 
I don't know. I you know we're, I guess we're I don't want to sound all preachy, but you yeah. know the the chainsaw chaps and a helmet. It's probably and and heavy duty you know steel toed boots, probably 150 bucks total. You know. Yeah, and don't let vanity get in the way of safety, even though you look goofy. Yeah. yeah. And as it turns out, as we've learned over the years, you know, uh, guys, some ladies find that quite attractive. As uh, people have taken pictures of Eric while he was working. <laughs> yeah, there's a uh, there's some women that like men with a tool belt, you know, or <laughs> chainsaw chaps, and or uh, yeah, or a safety helmet. Yeah. Which is fine with me, because I, I, I dress like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, should we go on to uh, uh, the viewer mail about uh, car repair? Yes. Is the buzzing from the hot water heater too loud? No, no, it's fine. Okay. It says, hi, Eric. Just wanted to say that watching you replace the, that fender on our How to Replace the Fender in Your Car video has inspired me to do more of my work on my car again. I used to do most of my own work when I was in my 20s, and there's no reason I can't do it now. Anyways, anyway, your hardware in the hubcap tip is fine until you step on it, step on the hubcap, that is, and all the pieces go flying into the grass. I picked up a bunch of magnetic part dishes at Harbor Freight for a dollar or two and leave them all over the place. So that's basically I had a hubcap where I put on the nuts and bolts, and he said if you have a magnetic bowl like that it's perfect what i also thought is you have a hubcap laying around an old metal one which is rare and rarer now right. um put a magnet in it and that and then the, all the bolts will stick there yeah if you have an old hard drive pull the hard drive apart there's crazy strong magnets inside hard drives yeah so i um we did a little emailing back and forth and we were talking about uh heating up bolts with a propane torch before you uh loosen them so they don't seize and he wrote back, he said, I successfully used my propane torch with a MAP gas bottle, MAP gas is M-A-P-P, -P, to heat a stud on my tractor, and it got the stud glowing orange, which surprised me. I don't know how it would work in an engine block, because an engine block is a big heat sink. Um, yeah. And he wrote, the last episode interviewing Erica Wides was great. She's a terrific guest, and the two of you really kept things moving and interesting. I learned some stuff I can hardly wait to try, and I'm going to find her new show. So... Great. Um, map gas is like propane gas, burns a little bit hotter. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go buy a, can a canister of it. Yeah, I don't think I've, I've never used it. Do you use the same stuff? Same same torch head. Yeah. Torch head and everything. Yeah. So I have to replace the thermostat on my F-150. And the thermostat is right on the front of the block. And it's held in by two or three bolts. But since the alternator episode, I just kind of have this dread about shearing off bolts. Yeah. So from now on, I'm going to use an impact wrench and a torch on all bolts I have to take off of my truck. <laughs> <laughs> so there the, you go. Uh, yeah, I've got those little magnetic dishes all over the place too. They're they they're great. very very handy, and they stick to toolboxes, so they're, it's, they're easy to keep track of. Yeah, and you can find Erica Wide's internet radio show on the Heritage Radio Network, heritageradionetwork.com, or on iTunes. Just type in. Uh, why we cook or Erica Wides? Uh, Did she? It'll show up. She's relaunching a show or something, right? Did she? Uh, she's just gonna change up her show. She's gonna change it. I don't really know. Um, she said, "Well, you'll just have to listen." I was like, "Okay, it'll still be Erica, and it'll still be her." She's great. She can talk by herself. It's amazing. <laughs> I can't do it. Um, and you learn a lot from her. She has some very strong opinions. But because of her, I planted a bunch of radishes, which are coming up right now. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. What was funny is I was listening to that, and uh, I was like, oh, yeah, radish is cooked uh, on there. So that's cool. Yeah. And we have one more. You want to read it, sir? Uh, yes. Let's see. Um, th uh, thanks for your safety video on using chainsaws. After the video, I went to your website and saw this video of you building a cold frame hoop house. You are classic and unique, so don't change. <laughs> <laughs> your common sense approach to the background input from your – uh, oh, and the background input from your camera person and others makes DIY projects fun to learn. I hope you don't feel dumb making mistakes or repeating things a second or third time because we all have done it and will continue. God bless you. There you go. There you go. What what we what we hope to do here is to learn from Eric both from his successes and the mistakes. But everyone else can share their mistakes too, you know. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> so you don't feel all alone. <laughs> oh, you know, the, yeah. you know, the stuff that comes out perfect is rare, and we, I think, everyone knows that. Right. So. I used uh, at uh, at work this week. Perfection is the enemy of completion. Yay! Yeah, because my boss just really wanted to make sure we had something absolutely perfect before we put it in place. I'm like, we'll never be done. Yeah. You know, I think some things need to be perfect. You know, like if you're launching uh, a rocket into space or a submarine, perhaps, you know? <laughs> well, yeah. and But along the way, you know, you're learning from mistakes until you finally say, okay, we're ready to go. If you try to do it all at once, make it perfect on the first shot with no tests, yeah. never, not going to happen. Yeah, well, I mean, like any of the, the, the Apollo uh, moon landings, they were kind of winging it a lot, I think, as well. So Yeah. But we've talked about that. So, <laughs> all right. Anything else, sir? Uh, Fourth of July coming up. I saw a guy on a motorcycle who I kind of wanted to wave down, but I didn't want him to, you know, crash because I was driving next to him. But he had uh, across his back, he had that he was a veteran of uh, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And I just kind of wanted to give him a thumbs up and thanks. Fourth um, of July is coming up. Parade. Stand up. Take your hat off when the flag comes by. Say thanks to a veteran. Yeah, I um, I have my American flag. Um, there you go. Don't blow off any fingers, people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, if you would like to contact us, you can send us an email. You can email Mike, you know. It's Mike at GardenFork.tv. Or you can find us on Facebook. It's uh, Facebook.com slash GardenFork. There's a lot of nice little conversations that happen on our Garden Fork page. And I try and be active there. And on Twitter, uh, GFR underscore Mike. And I am Garden Fork TV, all one word. And we're also on YouTube. There, Garden Fork has a YouTube channel there. And uh, we're on iTunes and on the site, right? Yep. You know, I there was a little Twitter that I put up there, a tweet that I put up there that uh, I thought you might comment on, but you didn't. <laughs> the... Uh... I came home for dinner one day and I had just some leftover rice and some tomato soup and beans and I, I made a meal out of that. And I said, hey, 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 it actually turned out pretty good. And I said, I'm, I'm regressing here. I'm sure uh, <laughs> I'm sure Eric is eating something that can be described as artisanal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but my foodie friends. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know. I had donuts this morning, so <laughs> they're from a large franchise. Oh, they, okay. I thought you were gonna tell me from a cart, and the guy's been yeah, it's his mother's recipe. And no, I'm up in the woods right now, so. <laughs> oh, we, that's right. We yeah. drove in the town. My father-in-law's here, and we don't have too much in common, so we just go to the donut store. You know? <laughs> 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 oh, we got all these beekeep. I gotta tell these beekeeping stories, but we'll tell them the next time. So. Yeah, I was gonna say we completely forgot about the bees. I didn't. Oh, okay. And my forearms are still swollen. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a long story. All right, everyone. So make it a great day. And uh, we hope to hear from you again. Send us an email. or You can call our, our viewer voicemail line, too. I forgot to plug that. It's 860-740-6938. All right? 860-740-6938. Priscilla's going to be on us soon talking about garden pests. And she wanted you guys to ask her questions. All right. Oh, so great. Call with your garden pest questions or email them. But 860-740-6938. All right, everyone. So make it a great day. We'll see you. Bye.